never had an issue with alcohol. It's just, I finally realized I don't need it in my life anymore. Yeah. And I told Mike, I'm not going to keep picking you up at the bar and driving you home at two in the morning anymore. So I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Mike was actually a good friend of uh, my oldest son. They're they're still good friends. Uh, I hope hope we're still friends. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. uh, Anyway, he's, he's, he serves in Malibu all the time and he lives down in, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay alcohol is just i find you got a delay there but anyway uh, oh that was me i just turned on uh oh, I uh, got you. a little laptop next to me but anyway uh we got to know each other when i was down santa barbara they're going to usc uh ucsb together oh, wow. so um they were still partying a little bit back in those days and i was yeah. uh, playing the dad role you know but uh <laughs> oh man we were still partying up until not too long ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. Until I moved up here. We, we moved up here from LA uh, in 2016, Robert. So, wow. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, we're live, everybody. Welcome. We, the great Robert Stanley on with us. We're going to uh, hit record and get fired up. So, um, let's uh, do it now. We'll start the podcast. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful state of Jefferson here on the uh, Smith River. I'm a little out of it today. I'm just getting over uh, the, I got finally came down with the 5G poisoning. Um, I'm, I'm actually, Bear, going through a little sweats right now. So, uh, hey guys, bear with me if uh, I'm a little out of it and not my normal self, but I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad to somewhat be feeling normal, uh, even though uh, I still can't smell anything. So um, next week we have Kelly Brogan on and we can talk a little bit more about this and some of my thoughts uh, going through this. Uh, considering what our perspective is on uh, contagion and germs and all that. But so, yeah, but it's good to be here and uh, we're excited. Uh, we have Anarcha Poco next week. Uh, Bear Lando will be featured uh, with his talk there. And uh, if you guys are down in Al- Alcapoco already, please uh, give us some support there. We can't be there in person, but uh our friends Sayer G is there, Andy Kaufman, uh, a ton of our a ton of our homies and uh, friends are down in El Capoco for that, and we're really excited to be involved again as a sponsor and having Bear talk. So shout out to Jeff Berwick and everybody with uh, the Anarcha Poco event. And uh, what else is going on, Bear? Anything else uh, going on on your end before we fire this up? Well, we've just got massive uh, Oregon manipulation here where they're trying to dry out, you know, Northern California. We had uh, record rainfall and then abruptly stopped just exactly at the same time they stopped it last year. And, you know, if you understand the Oregon technology that they're using or the technology to manipulate the Oregon, uh, it literally dries stuff out. And then you hear about the forest fires where, you know, trees are burning from the inside out. Well, if you understand how they manipulate that, then it really, um, you know, sucks the moisture right out of plants, makes them more prone to, you know, just uncontrollable fires. And then, of course, when I was working with Oregon State University in the agriculture department, we have their brilliant scientists that are out there spraying, uh, you know, bugs that are just on the scene trying to take care of old decaying trees and everything that are tried out. And, and, and then they blame the bark beetles and you know, so it gets back into the whole germ theory thing as it's uh, related to ecology. Anyway, uh, you know, we're, um, you can't fix stupid and we're right in the middle of it. And that's why uh, I'll let you do your intro, but I'm really uh, happy to have Robert with us today because he's going to set us straight on a lot of things of what's really going on there. So Mike, do your thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it has been bizarre weather, (laughs) super dry. It's going to be in the high 70s up here uh, today and tomorrow, but we have, we've been having the heavy frost every morning. Um, and uh, what I've been telling uh, everyone in the alphabetic community is get on the org, start making Organite. We got to get the earth pipes in the ground. 
uh, and start generating some of that healthy orgone energy to combat this because uh, I, for one, am not going to let this go by. And I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to try to uh, counter that. So, and uh, we know it works from our friend, Mitch, the orgone uh, dealer, who's been having great success. So, uh, but yeah, this one's going to be fun today. Researcher renowned Robert Stanley takes us on a journey from UFO activity in Washington, DC to hidden history revealed and everything in between. During his passionate pursuit of modern and ancient mysteries, Robert Stanley has traveled to 59 countries in 59 years. His quest for new ideas and information inspired his years of research and popular writings covering many controversial topics. His ongoing investigations have been featured on television, radio, print, and the internet. Born in 1959, Robert is a Los Angeles native. He grew up in Malibu and moved to uh, southern New England with his family in 2008. In early 2015, he relocated his family to Hong Kong and full circle back to Southern California in 2019. And now he's in, uh, in Florida, uh, five yeah. days into being in Southern Florida. Uh, Robert is the author of two groundbreaking books on the hidden history of UFO activity in Washington, D.C., and is presently the webmaster of UnicusMagazine.com and host of the Unicus Radio Hour. Uh, on this episode, we'll undoubtedly take deep dives into many topics within the context of Robert's investigative adventures. We'll discuss the presence of a megalithic sphinx in Malibu underwater UFOs linked to a 95 uh, 100 BC cataclysm, angels and the archonic presence amidst mankind for starters. I mean, those are just some ideas here we could be covering, Bear, um, but I really just want to hear from Robert on the state of affairs going on right now and how it connects to all of his experiences in life. But uh, Bear, yeah, this is going to be a good one today. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for being with us here today, Robert. Um, really you. appreciate the time. And, uh, you know, I love all the material that, you know, I was writing that up last night and uh, I love going into all those uh, subject matters and, you know, lost history and mysteries unveiled. And, but I know you're much, much more than that. <laughs> and you have a whole wealth of knowledge about, you know, what's really going on. Um, it, you know, we, we talk about uh, Anunnaki and, you know, other um, sort of entities will say that might be manipulating us. I like, uh, uh, Trevor Constable's uh, terminology when he calls them the, the boys downstairs. So I've always used that <laughs> terminology. Um, you know, I think there's um, a couple things going on here right now. There's uh, resets, of course, and there's two of them. There's yeah. a reset, which is basically the collapse, which a lot of us, you know, I've been around, I got a few years under my belt, so I've been waiting for this for a long time. So I'm fun, fondly uh, witnessing it, not that I want to see uh, death and carnage, but we knew that it was designed to fail and collapse in the first place. So let's just hurry up and get it over with. And then, of course, those of us that have been seeking the truth are not afraid of anything. We're just realize that, you know, we've been busy for a long time building a parallel universe. So we have uh, something already prepared you know, so we won't get caught in the aftermath. Then there's the other reset. And it's the folks, I think, that are really choosing to stay asleep. And I believe that's the role that maybe the, you know, you, you kind of categorize, I want to hear more about this, you call benevolent Anunnaki, yeah. uh, which I want to hear about, but maybe the non benevolent boys downstairs, uh, you know, are trying to take a few souls with them in the process. And that's the choice we all have right now. I kind of look at it as a matter of polarities and archetypes and, and, you know, you can fill in uh, more historical details than I'm capable, but I look at it as, you know, you have the Luciferian influence, which was more that Eastern, um, you know, philosophy of, you know, seeking out of uh, realm or out of body experiences. And then you have the, you know, with Rudolf Steiner, he talked about Aramon and, you know, the coming of Aramon and more the reductionist materialistic sort of mindset that we find ourselves in right now, uh, you know, which is just uh, gross materialism with no mana to hold anything together. That's why we're seeing things collapse. But then right in the middle of the two, you know, I don't look at those as good, bad or otherwise, but right in the middle of the two, I believe it's the Christ consciousness, which yeah. is emerging of, uh, you know, making that connection with spirit, but then grounding that in, you know, to create heaven on earth. That's just kind of my philosophy, the way uh, I see things. 
I uh, just wanted to throw that out there to see if uh, that could get us started. And, and I want to hear more about what you think about things. Um, we had a great uh, talk before we went on air, too, about surfing. I'd be happy to talk about surfing the whole time. But I think our audience uh, doesn't want to listen to that. So let's. Um, uh, how do you want to uh, start this off? Want to go maybe into how you got involved, your research sources, you know, when you're looking at these other entities that are manipulating us big time and how you came to your conclusions. Yeah. And thanks thank for being you. here again. Oh, my pleasure, Doc. And uh, Mike, thank you guys. It's, uh, <laughs> kindred spirits, souls of a feather flocking together here, uh, as it were. So, um, Mike, I'm glad you're okay and that you're doing taking steps to protect yourself. I think we all need to do that right now. However, whether you believe it or not, radiation sickness is a problem. It's, it's like the last thing that most people ever think about because the experts, those, those so-called scientists that we're supposed to trust, are not telling us about it. It's, it's the lay people that seem to be reporting it. And, and, and you'd had a conversation with Jay Campbell about this. The book is called The Invisible Rainbow. And in it, it talks about flu-like symptoms, also called, um, I think, influenza caused by radiation. And one of the side effects is psychosis. Wow, if you've looked at any social media, how many psychotic people do you see making posts out there now? I mean, we've always had crazy people, but... It's become, it's become an epidemic. That's the real epidemic is consciousness has been so badly distorted by the dark side. And you can call them whatever you want, um, but they are definitely working for a Luciferian agenda. Now, just to be clear, I've made some mistakes over the years because I'm, I'm in the process of learning just like everybody else. And it's not that simple. There's a lot of lies or layers and layers of lies that have been told with a little bit of truth kind of sandwiched in there. So it's been difficult for me to sort through all that, but I persisted. And because I just felt, you know, the thing is, it may sound correct at the time, but the more you think about it and analyze it, do a comparison to other information and new information as it comes up, I realize that Lucifer is not Anki. I know that's, that's the common belief right now, especially people on the internet that have read Sitchin and all these little groups and stuff about so-called Anunnaki, which just translates to the shining ones. I didn't know that until last year. I knew there were beings that are shining. I'd met one back in 85 in Malibu up in the mountains. And I, it took me decades to figure out not only who he was, but who they are. And what is their relationship to us? And it is both good and evil, right? So part, the, those that are on the, the dark side of the equation, they're the ones that are causing us to, to harm ourselves. And it's serving their agenda, all right? So, and there's multiple ways we do it. It's not just radiation, although that's probably the most nefarious one of them all because it's invisible. It's around us all the time. We don't smell it. We don't taste it. But we see the effects of it. And it's been increasing gradually for for decades now, they just keep amping it up. So um, we're all we're all being affected in that regard, uh, physically, spiritually, mentally. They're they're doing what they can now. The thing about the reason I, you mentioned Lucifer in the book, The Shining Ones, and there's a few of them. But if you go to my website at unicusmagazine.com, it's spelled U-N-I-C-U-S magazine. You've got to call. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, right. Mike's reading it. You got a a yes. In there, it talks about a guy. This is a a big, massive tomb, too. This is not a a a small book here by any means. No, it's like was it seven hundred pages? Something. Yeah, it's it's a good size. You don't need to read it all, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, you can access it if you know. In fact, if you here's the thing. I'm still on the prologue two right now. (laughs) The first couple hundred pages, in my opinion, are the most important. Um, that book is like $75 US. It's printed in England, but you can get it shipped from San Diego. If you go through my website, you'll connect directly with the publisher. And it's a lot less. Amazon, cut, I don't know why people are charging so much for it. It's, it. I don't think they should. Anyway, the bottom line is in there, it talks about 
this individual that was created as a god or administrator of the lower realms. And now from a Hindu perspective or from the, the uh, Vedic literature, we learn of this character named Kals. See, it's K-A-L. That's just his first name. I'm sure he has a lot of other titles, but he's not imprisoned on this planet. And he doesn't personally do all this nefarious stuff. He oversees he admit, the, admit, his administration who takes care of it. So he delegates all of this stuff. Now, why on earth would a benevolent God create that something like that? I've struggled this. I'm look, I'm 62 now. And I've been struggling with this most of my life, trying to figure this out. And, and actually, until I started reading that book, The Shining Ones, it didn't make any sense. The very beginning of that book spells it out very clearly. All these different realms, these lower realms, are here designed to challenge us like a classroom. What is the point of going to school? To learn. Well, how do they do that? They challenge us with tests. Well, first they give us the information and then they test us by giving us questions to see if we're paying attention. So we're being challenged constantly in school in order to learn and go from incrementally. Okay. And that's the thing about the lower realms. It's, it's very clearly delineated in there. I don't know why the Hindus or the Vedic literature is so clear where others are not, but thank goodness there's some reference point that as souls, we descend down into this lower realm so that we can learn. And in the process, it's not just mental stimulation. It's, it's a cultivating of our potential as souls. Because the physical is, is uh, transitory. The souls are permanent. So the potential of a soul is not fully activated. Just like a seed, you know, you could sit it on a shelf. It doesn't do anything. But it has the potential to be to do a lot. If, but if you but you have to put it in the soil and it struggles up through the you know to the through this dark into the light, and it has to compete and and. <laughs> but if it gets the right amount of light and water and nutrients and even some appreciation from people, humans and and other you know life forms, it'll flourish. Just and that's that's the best analogy I have for who we are, how we got here, and why we're here, where and where we're headed. You know, uh, you mentioned seed and also DNA, which is interesting. In one of your other yeah. talks recently, I heard you talking about DNA. And, yeah. uh, you know, I look at DNA, it's just uh, what I call dual impedance antenna. And, yeah. uh, you know, it receives resonance. And as you uh, pointed out, it's hollow and it's all about resonance. The whole universe communicates through resonance. But um, depending on the DNA in that particular seed or in the seed that each one of us uh, embodies around, because that seed is what initiates the whole embryological unfoldment of the next embodiment for us. It has all of those DNA configurations that uh, are mirroring all our past experiences, everything we put into play. So now that seed, you know, is going to be more like an Akashic that's going to pick up that resonance. You know, scientists, of course, you're trying to say, boy, how can a tree grow from this little seed? Well, it has nothing to do with that. It's just going to take in the residence, just like we do, you know, to grow a new body ourselves. But anyway, um, you know, I think if people really understand yeah, as you say, you know, everything physical here is very transitory, but it, we do operate as capacitors and our um, whole journey here, I think, is to, uh, you know, uh, get our configuration back to the original blueprint so that uh, we don't keep manifesting our uh, aberrations and go back to the original perfection. But yeah. please go on. So in that book, actually, the, that's the third book or fourth book by that author. Uh, he's deceased now, uh, Christian O'Brien. He, he's from England. Uh, and actually, he was a scientist, I believe. He was a, a geologist, which is a form of science. You know, these days, everybody wants to worship scientists. Um, and actually, it talks about scientists in there. The Anunnaki scientists, they had a name for them. They were called serpents. They didn't call them scientists, they call them serpents. So when we read about a serpent in the garden that tricked our ancestors, that would have been a scientist. 
An Anunnaki sense. scientist, yes. And they said, they, they delineated it further. They said, um, there is the one-eyed uh, serpent and the two-eyed serpent. One is, is a much higher level, like has twice the knowledge of, you know, the lower. And that's, that's actually what he says in the book, is that these those who are the fallen angels, the fallen Anunnaki, um, are they're, they're lower ranking within the society. It's a caste system, you know, there's a hierarchy there. So whatever they taught us was very limited in the, in the full spectrum of, of knowledge and technique when it comes to spiritual awareness and also manifestation. Just manipulating matter is, is child's play. That's any moron can do that. Even you give, you give a, you know, a monkey a hammer, he's going to do something with it. But, but manifesting from your soul using waves of consciousness or love, however you want to look at it, because that's really the, that's the, that's the frequency or the, what Schauberger was talking about, the centripetal force, how there's this coming together. It's what brings all the particles together is a centripetal force. And we could call that love. Some people call it negative energy, but it's not really negative in the, in the sense that we use that word. It's actually very beneficial. I mean, things just wouldn't, manifest without it. And um, I've been learning more about, you know, these so-called miracles that the masters do is because they understand these processes. It's, it's miraculous to us because we don't understand it, but it's achievable. Anybody can learn it. They just have to want to learn it. And the, the problem is though, most of this information has been hidden from us because um, they, they, the lower ranking Anunnaki, the fallen ones, they, they don't want, um, well-educated slaves. Now I don't think of us as slaves, but apparently some of them do. And that was not the original. This is one of the things that got them in trouble. They were supposed to look over, watch over us. And in fact, what they did was they tried to enslave us and they got punished severely for it. And obviously we suffered some consequences for it too. But this goes back to what I said before about the, what is the point of all this? Why is it being permitted? Um, and the thing I found out as I'm reading that book, actually I had to read it a few times to fully understand what, what was being said there, what's being presented, is that there, that there is a purpose to all this and that we are being challenged individually and collectively. So even though the Anunnaki descended down here to this realm and they were experiencing you know, some incredible lessons, they're here to learn too. They make mistakes too. Even though we call them gods or angels or you know, whatever, shining ones, <laughs> they're not God and they're in a process of cultivating their true potential as well. Now we are intimately related to them. And the explanation from O'Brien is, is so much different than Sitchin. It's almost like, you know, two different stories altogether. And I know there's things that O'Brien didn't get to for whatever reason, there's more to the story that he hasn't gotten to, or he didn't get to in, the, in this life. And actually that book, that was his last book, was uh, not well received by the media, academia, and even the so-called new age communities didn't appreciate it because Sitchin got there first. Actually, it was, it was um, uh, Von Donneken and his foolishness. And then it was Sitchin and his theories, mostly fiction, like the lost book of Enki, it says right there in the, in the foreword, it said, this is fiction. This is what I think Enki was, you know, it's just, it's silliness, but it had a very big impact on the consciousness of the collective. There's people that worship Enki. It's like, they think that, and here's the funny thing. After reading O'Brien's work, I realized Enki didn't really have much to do with us. And he, he certainly didn't fight with his brother or his dad. All of that narrative came from the lower ranking shining ones or Anunnaki who are pissed off at their superiors still, just like criminals always get mad at the judicial system, right? Or, they do. They don't like law enforcement. They don't, you know, they, and they're always trying to blame other people for their actions. They don't want to take responsibility. 
So they blame others. And this is, and we, this is a really big problem right now. Anyway, I hope this is making sense to you guys. Well, the, one, the one thing too is what this author, um, you know, is pulling from, I yeah. realize is a much more synchron, uh, synchronistic sources where he's taking from uh, the Coptics, the, he's taking from not just the Sumerian. Very holistic. And stuff. Yes. Yeah, very, and, and I haven't gotten very far into it, but I guess even touches on uh, he talks about Japan, talks about, uh, you know, uh, so it's, I think that's really important because I think we're dealing with archetypes in many respects here and, and an understanding that the, I'm a big fan of the law of one and the idea that for all we know, these Anunnaki, right, these are just, we're us at one point too that have fallen and it's, everything's level, everything's fractal, right? And, yeah. um, and so when we as humans like to always project into whether it be a god or an et or some kind of other intelligence because that is just the nature of us are, are in this 3d density trying to figure things out but right. really um i think it, it comes very apparent when you look at all these different cultures the similarities be between them all that really it's just part of the human consciousness and the consciousness in general in this realm and that we're all connected even with like you said these quote unquote anunnaki or angel or ascended masters or whatever you want to call them yeah so here's the thing, though, that, that when you speak about the Akashic Record, that's, uh, that's such a vague term that I hear people throwing around all the time. Um, I prefer to refer, I refer to it as the cosmic web of light. That's what scientists call it. Now, I was shown that up on a mountain in Malibu one night when I was having contact with, I don't know who, but somebody with advanced technology was, they were they were monitoring myself and my buddy, and uh, they, they, they showed me something in my mind that was bizarre. I mean, because I was fully awake, but it was like a dream in the sense that I, there was an overlay, and suddenly I was seeing things differently. I could actually see that everything was connected through this web of light, and that was at the, that was at the micro scale. Everything around me, including myself, was connected through these filaments of light, and it was very uh kinetic uh, and it was you know flowing and then uh years later i found out that scientists call it this cosmic web of light and they're looking at it at a macro scale using machines and they realize that everything is connected through this web of light which is a transfer not only of energy but of consciousness so just like the internet we're using the internet now but it's a very poor copy it's a very limited copy of that and so how do we tap into that? Well, some people call it a kundalini awakening. It's when, it's when our soul is in a state of resonance and it begins to connect just like a modem or a router, whatever. We start to connect or reconnect with that cosmic web of light. And that's when all kinds of information is accessible. Also healing takes place. Um, and you, if, when it's time, when a person is ready or a soul is ready and they want to start manifesting, they tap into that flow of light or energy and, and use it to then, uh, broadcast a patterning because all the platonic solids are just wave patterns, all of them. Okay. And, and, but how do we do that? It's from our heart. The heart chakra is where the seed of the soul. So, so the Christians call this the, um, uh, they say that the, the kingdom of heaven is within. It, it's not a complete statement. It should say the doorway to the kingdom of heaven is within our heart, the heart chakra. The only way we can do that, though, is to be in a very calm and peaceful and loving place. And that's kind of hard to do right now. That's one of the reasons why the dark side is constantly provoking us and trying to keep us, you know, distracted. So it's, but the, the cool part about this is it's accessible to anyone at any time if they so desire. It just takes effort. You know, first of all, you have to know it's there. You have to want to connect. And then, and then you have to really focus, stay focused. Like a lot of people, because my dad was um, a disciple of Yogananda. 
So I was, I was familiar even from early age about meditation. I always thought it was kind of goofy um, until I actually tried it, you know, like meditating, like my life depended on it. I, and, that, and that's how I entered this realm of light. Uh, I was using an old Vedic technique, Kriya Yoga, and uh, I was saying Om, and I was sitting on the ground, and and uh, eventually I just left my body and was in the realm of light. So I was connected to the cosmic web of light then. I didn't even know it. And it, it, it changes you. Changed me. I mean, it changes everybody who has a, that kind of an awakening is never the same person. Absolutely. Uh, so, but anyway, it's like I said, it's, it's, it doesn't cost anything. It just takes time. Now, the med- it, med- it's not like you have to meditate in a sense where you, most people think you just blank your mind out. It, what it really is, it's a form of uh, uh, an intense form of concentration on one thing and one thing only without any judgment. So it's, it's a, it, it takes a tremendous amount of observation without any judgment. Because our mind, especially the way we've been programmed, we tend to, and especially now with the antisocial or the socialist media that are is out there right now, everybody wants to just comment, you know, just judgment, judgment, judgment. No, we need to go the other way. If we really want to connect, if we want to get back to the our original divine blueprint, we, we have to awaken the Kundalini, that spark. You know, it's like, it's like look, when you, when, you, when you have an ember and you want to, to, to stoke it into a flame, you gently blow on it. Okay, the same is true when we cultivate this, this soul. The, that that it's, it's, a, it's a different thing, but you, it's what I was telling you. You got it. We have to calm down completely and stop judging, thinking so much about, you know, our, our judgment of everything and just observe to the best of our ability. And the more we do it, like anything else, the easier it becomes and the better we come, become at it. And that's when all kind, literally the doors open <laughs> to the universe, all, all the universes. Pretty amazing. Don't you think, don't you think Robert, that um, the enlightenment process, you know, I think a lot of us are still waiting for the big bolt of lightning to hit, but I think it no. happens in moments, you know, and I, yeah. a lot of us now are, getting more and more moments with uh, less time in between. And, you know, that allows you to connect dots. And, and just like you say, you know, that, that flame is, uh, you know, just kind of expanding in that way. You mentioned that geometric forms and uh, there's a guy by the name of Frank Chester who created the form, uh, the Chestahedron. He's an artist and a mathematician. uh, Basically he showed how the five platonic (laughs) solids are all, um, unified in the chestahedron, which actually is the heart. And of course, we know now also the heart is not a pump, it's a vortex. Yeah. And I think we live in a great time, though, because all this kind of left brain stuff, which I always preoccupied myself with, um, you know, is really aligning up with what we used to call metaphysics. And I think the value of that is, um, you know, it allows us to reconcile our two hemispheres so we can go into that space, into the heart, but then, uh, you know, have our other part just say, yeah, that kind of makes sense too. So it just shuts up and lets you go into those other places. And, uh, you know, technology said like computers, I don't believe they're here to serve our needs to the extent that we are using them for. They are here to mirror the fact that there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. All that exists inside of us. And we actually have the re- real deal. You know, we figured that out in medicine a long time ago, mm. um, back in the eighties, you know, when the, the new little apple cubes and things were coming out, we were working in levels of neurology and saying, wow, we've got the real deal here. All we have to do is figure out what the keyboard is, how to manipulate it, which we <laughs> did over the years. And, uh, you know, that's really us. And then we can throw away all this plastic and everything. But yeah. no, this is an amazing time to be alive. And, sure. and then when you focus, like you say, you're creating that centripetal effect where you can just manifest, you know, uh, kind of crystallize those, um, those informational fields in the manifestation of our choosing, but don't get attached so that they have a chance to radiate back up and, you know, just keep uh, nice new uh, frames for the movie happening all the time instead of getting stuck in any one place. So I think that's what enlightenment is. And it's happening right now. And I think we just need to recognize it. 
Well, our DNA actually receives and emits light. And this is what I was saying about being calm on a physical and emotional level, because the DNA actually constricts when we're stressed out and it becomes less conductive. When we're, the more relaxed we are, the more conductive the light energy is as it goes past through us. Now, as far as the heart, you said it's a vortice, vortices, uh, centripetal vortices. What I read was that it's uh, the book, I think it's called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. Dr. Tom Cowan. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic book. Um, he said it was a capacitor. It charges and discharges, charges and discharges. Yeah, I and agree it, with that. Uh, okay. So, so, but in the process of the charging, discharging, it creates a vortices. So, okay. This goes back to what we have started with about radiation. It's no wonder so many people are dying of heart attacks. I know about all the other reasons, but the one reason that people are not discussing is the fact that we are electromagnetic and that the heart is, the Heart Math Institute shows that, the, you know, depending on your state of wellness, your heart, the, the energy around your heart chakra is, is either diminished when you're ill or it can be huge, many feet away from you and when you're healthy and happy. So um, again, this is what I'm saying, the doorways and heart, the, the heart is actually the first organ to form in the zygote, okay? And there's a reason for that because everything else has got to form around something. Uh, you'd also talked about the seed. In Hawaii, they have a saying there, it's ano ano. It means that the fruit is in the seed. Well, how could that be? Well, because it's just like I was saying about our souls, the potential for the fruit has already been holographically programmed into the seed. Yet, what, is that an accident? Obviously not. That's divine consciousness being programmed into, or the patterning, the patterning, it's all there. It's like, look, everything, and let me explain it this way. You wanna build a car? What do you start with? A blueprint, no. You start with a concept. You get some guys together or girls, whatever, these days are working, some girls are working the scene. It all starts in here well, or here, when, however we wanna look at it. It's, just, it's on another level, it's pure consciousness. It's a concept. Then you put the, take the concept and you put it into 2D on a paper or these days 3D in a CAD drawings in a computer. Then you make up a model out of clay, believe it or not, a lot of those cars they start with. Clay models. So I used to work for Honda. I seen how it was done. But people don't realize this about ourselves, you know, again, because we've, it's part of the challenge here. We've been uh, taken off the path of light. That's the first book by uh, Mr. O'Brien. The path of light is extraordinary if you're a spiritual person, not a religious person, but if you are on the spiritual path, truly the path of light, that's a book worth reading. You can only, I think it's only available as a PDF. And again, you can link up on my website for that. But I was blown away by this um, because if you're not on the path of light, you're on the path of darkness and it's a choice. It's a personal choice. Now, obviously they're trying, the dark side is trying to manipulate us. They're like, come on over to the dark side. <laughs> or they'll, they'll say, if you don't go, we're going to make your life miserable. It's like, uh, it's, if it's, it's, it's carrot in the stick, literally. But the, the, you know, the, the beings of light, some people have asked me, so how do you tell the difference? Well, the beings of light are benevolent and they are respectful of our free will. They'll offer to help us, but they're not going to do it for us. And they're certainly not going to threaten us. You know, that's just not how it works. And the other thing is they don't lie. If they tell you something and you realize it's true, you see it actually, it comes true, or you realize that it is accurate. <laughs> that's the metric. That's how we understand when we're dealing with benevolent beings. And it's just, is part of the process that we have to go through. Just like when we go to school, some teachers suck. You, you know, you don't even want to be around them. other teachers. And it's, it seems like there's never enough of them. But you know, you've met a few teachers in your life go, wow, I really want to go to school today and talk to this, you know, learn more from this person because they make me feel empowered. And that's how it should be. I, I'm a big believer in reciprocity and that, that we're all here to help each other, even though we have to do things you know, individually, we're part of this collective, this giant family. And, and uh, 
So the, the concept of being saved is, re, or, you know, winning the battle is, is, I think is another huge distraction because oh, yeah. each one of us has to grow at our own pace. Yeah. And it, the other trippy, I, what you're saying about where does it start with, it comes with a concept, starts with a concept. Well, where does that concept come from? You know, we don't, <laughs> that concept's being delivered to us from something too, our yeah. higher self or, yeah. you know, so in, you're right. It's the, and what Bear Lando says uh, a lot uh, is that this is a give and give more um, reality. It's all about giving. The reciprocity you're you're dead on there that's how it all works well okay so in a family we all we all help each other you don't we don't you know like okay so this is the thing and we don't judge each other we try not to obviously there's things we don't like but we don't like if somebody makes a mistake you don't go that's it you're out get out of the family I, I i disown you i mean people do that sometimes i've i've gone through that it's silly the truth is you can't really disown anybody because we're all here. There's no other place to go. We're all part of creation. You know, we are creators too. And we need to, the other problem is we, we don't, especially right now, people are trying to, there's a blame game, the victimhood. That's such a, that's, that's such dark side nonsense. It's pure dissonance. It, it, people, everybody makes mistakes. Okay. And we're supposed to learn from them and we're supposed to help each other figure out, okay, look, you made a mistake. Here's how you do it correctly. Next time, try it this way. That's all. It's, it's really very simple, actually, you know, it's, 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 it wasn't meant to be that difficult unless here's the thing. One of the reasons when we start going down the path, the dark side, the path of darkness, it hurts for a reason. It's, it's like when we're sick, you know, it's like, Hey, you got a problem. You better fix it. It doesn't feel good by design, you know? So the thing about what I was saying about the lower realms, it, I used to think that was a mistake. Because how could a benevolent God ever permit that to happen? Now, I was shocked as I read the, that book, The Shining Ones. I realized not only was it permitted, it was mandated by God or whatever you want to call the creator of all, of all of it. And, and that blew my mind. And I actually started realizing this character, the head guy, Satan, is another word for adversary. You talk about controlled opposition. He was created by the creator to be the controlled opposition so that we could, I mean, because how else are we going to exercise free will? If we don't understand the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, light and dark, then we can't exercise that ability and actually become who, you know, activate our true potential, our full potential, I should say. So, Robert, do you yeah. think that this realm originally was intended to be the school of hard knocks or <laughs> was that our um, kind of free will decision to put things in motion that made it that way? It's as hard as you make it, Doc, mm -hmm. or as hard as I make it, right? Because I can make bad mm -hmm. decisions all day long. And what happens? I'm going to suffer. Mm -hmm. If I make good decisions, then I'm going to, things are going to get better and better and better. And that's, well, sorry. Did I lose you guys? I bumped something. No, you're here. <laughs> better put that away. So, so I know I'm op oversimplifying it and people say, well, you know, what about cancer and for kids and all this stuff? I, okay. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's horrible, but can we heal them? Yes, we can. I'm uh, not obviously not with radiation <laughs> because most kids are most of all of us have cancer because of radiation. So that would be the last thing you want to do. Anyway, the here's oh, the other thing it says in that book. I guess you haven't read it yet, but um, maybe Michael loan it to you when he's done. Is it uh, says I want to, yeah. Oh, it's, it's worth it. Actually, you know what? Uh -huh. If you email me, I'll send you a PDF. It'd probably be easier. Uh, awesome. I, got to know the, I got to know the publisher. I've helped him sell a lot of books, but I've also been giving books to people that I that are on the path and need mm -hmm. this a little bit more. Like it's like you know fertilizing the the garden. So so the lower realm would be the physical plane. Above that is the astral plane, and above that is the causal plane, and above that would be we just loosely call it heaven, the realm of light, pure light. There is no duality, and you know. But if we just were created there and we stayed there, it's like a seed has to drop off the tree into the ground. If it doesn't penetrate the soil, 
and it's not going to incubate. It won't germ, sorry, it won't germinate. That's the term, right? I'm big into horticulture. I was, my dad, my dad raised me in a garden, literally in our garden. And like every day there was stuff I had to learn how to do about to tend the garden. It's a matter of why you're smart. Gardeners are smarter than the rest (laughs) of the folks out there. Well, we were, that's part of the, the instruction was we're supposed to be good stewards of the earth. Mm-hmm. And actually, one of the most difficult things when I was living um, in Southern California this last time in uh, uh, Temecula Valley is well known now for vineyards. So and my wife likes wine. So we would go to these all these different vineyards. So I started looking into it. I found out that is really a very difficult task to grow not only the variety of grapes, but to cultivate them. It takes years to do this correctly. And the winemaking itself is a whole nother, that's a chemistry lab right there. So I was very surprised to find out that that was actually a test for nobility. You could not become a noble, especially, you know, like that had responsibility for a a region until you learned how to, to work a vineyard. Because it's the same thing. It's all about cultivating and taking responsibility for these life forms that just basically you're not going to thrive without your, your leadership or your guidance. You know, you mentioned the uh, four levels, the four planes, you know, I'd look at those more as the electronic planes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thought is produced at the mental plane or the causal, whatever you want to call it, the astral, more the emotional, it gives the intensity. So it can pop into the matrix, the, you know, the, the vital that we think of, that's just the overlay, you know, before it gets biological. But what's uh, neat again is today we live in an age where we can decipher that into many levels. Of course, the old alchemists put it into more element terms of, uh, you know, fire, air, water, and right. earth. And now we know that, you know, the fire is hydrogen, the, the, the earth is carbon, the air is uh, nitrogen, and uh, the water is oxygen. And we also understand how in the atmosphere, uh, you know, there's a conjugation of those elements that actually precipitates, creates a ferment in the air, then that goes down and creates matter. And of course, the matter has to form to the geometry that is, uh, you know, created by the capacitors, the inorganic elements and everything in the ground. So, you know, there's, there's really no more mysteries in an alchemical lab. You can duplicate these processes and precipitate things. And we're right. supposed to be living in the age of transmutation right now. Well, we are in the age of transmutation. We just yeah. don't know it yet. Right. And, uh, you know, all those, all that knowledge for all time is there. And uh, even the Western science has contributed some, uh, you know, it's led us down one extreme, but if you know how to extrapolate the good stuff, you can put it together and have a full science again, which in the old days was called alchemy, you know, instead of just reductionist chemistry. So um, yeah, uh, no secrets anymore. What perplexes me, maybe you can answer the question for me, is it seems fairly obvious that nothing would be here without a thought to initiate it in the first place. Right. We also can prove through conventional science that thoughts are electrical vectors. You can measure them, you know, and so forth. So what is it so difficult for most of us to wrap our minds around that we start everything in our world, in our experience, in our bodies in the first place? And you mentioned diseases. Yeah, it's a bummer if a kid gets cancer and everything. Well, we actually know that, you know, the, the disease and all that kind of thing is a ruse too. And if you understand what it's doing, why it's there in the first place, then on a functional level, you can, you know, just as easily reverse it and get off, you know, the wheel of what got you there in the first place. So, it seems like there's a real hypnotic effect going on here that prevents us from just seeing the obvious. Yeah. Well, th- by design. And again, this is coming from mm-hmm. these mad scientists. Let me just put this away. It's uh, mad scientists, the lower ranking Anunnaki. Um, uh, they only have this much knowledge. This is why they're called. They always do this. People don't know what that is. That's a one eyed one eyed serpent or scientists, as they call themselves, we're calling them, they call themselves, or whatever. It's the same thing. Um, they don't want us to know what they know. But if we, if we had the knowledge of a two-eyed serpent or scientists, like the higher scientists teach us everything you just talked about, we would all be healthy and happy and productive. And well, one of the things that I, 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 
I find about commercial farming is so stupid is that uh, they spraying nitrogen on the plants or putting it in the soil. Um, I've, I've learned, and I'm sure you already know this, but for people who don't aren't aware, it's, it's the microbes actually pull nitrogen out of the air and, and affix it to the plants naturally. Okay. Yep. So this nonsense about fertilizer being the, you know, the answer, though, unfortunately, most of the, the microbes are in the soil and the air are devastated by radiation and, uh, and other chemicals. So it's, it's like, wow. Um, you might also remember things used to be huge, relatively speaking, people and plants and insects, everything like, you know, used to be relative to us. We are dwarfs, actually. We're a freak. I mean, we're mutations because of the radiation that has diminished the capacity of life here to thrive. We, the original design was something completely different from what we are right now. So um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though. Was, what was it specifically? Um, it was more of a ramble, not an actual question, uh, but it, you know, it's just, that is a, a situation that really befuddles me over these yeah. years because there are things and I'm not, you know, I don't think, uh, I'm necessarily a smart guy or anything, but there are things that are very obvious that don't seem to be obvious to everybody. Oh, right. And there is information out there, not just information that's uh, academic, which is helpful, but also information yeah. to, you know, kind of tap us in on how to receive that resonance directly from the heart, you know, and you talked about seed. Well, we identified in uh, the, my work, um, you know, the seed atom, we called it. And of course that seed atom is the thing, as you uh, correctly said, that uh, forms the heart first embryologically and everything forms around that. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that is the uh, center of the toroidal field or whatever the heck you want to call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here we are. And as you're talking about um, archons and it sounds like there's a definitely hierarchy in the archon world, uh, you know, the benevolent, not so much. Uh, what are the consequences, uh, do you suppose, of uh, those that, uh, you know, fall more into manipulation games versus in the, the benevolent ones? Well, it, they're just going to go further down the path of darkness until they realize, uh, I don't want to be here anymore. How do I get out? Sometimes they cry out for help and help comes. That's all. Mm -hmm. There's an, an analogy there in the, the, the Path of Light, the book talking about Sophia. A lot of people have weird, very strange um, concept about what or who Sophia is. But it's, it's just a metaphor for those lost um, and in, in the dark, had literally gone down the path of darkness. And everybody experiences it. All souls do to various degrees. Some of us can tolerate more of that. And it's sort of like deep sea diving, you know, it's, and you can keep going down and down and down. And what happens is colder, darker, more pressure. And it just, it, it, it doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel good. Um, I think curiosity is what causes a lot of people to go, a lot of souls to go, you know, to go down there. But the initial oh, that, process, the, uh, dark, dark night of the soul. Yeah, the, the initial process, though, is like I said, like planting a seed, it has to go into the soil, into the darkness in order to germinate and then struggle back to the light. So, again, it's, it's not the best analogy. That's the one only one I can think of, again, because I've spent so much time with plants in the garden and, and animals. So I, I see there's but everything is organic, even though we're, we're living in a very synthetic world right now. Um, we're surrounded by, especially where I am now, it kind of reminds me of Hawaii, all these, all the birds and the, you know, the, the trees and stuff, the air is just, there's so much more oxygen here than, than Southern California. And, um, or actually the whole Southwest, I drove across the country for the first time and that, so I really got to see, see it. I mean, I've seen it from the air, but um, the difference is so stark. And you can feel it, you know, and uh, people are, I think, generally a little more friendly here because they're just more relaxed because they can actually breathe oxygen uh, to some extent. It's not we're not talking about air pollution. I'm just that's you know, that's they they show us this index of air quality. They don't tell you about the levels of oxygen and nitrogen in there. And, and what the effect is on people and plants, obviously, and other living things. 
anyway, uh, I, I tend to just wander, guys. I, I, so I got a lot. How's of, the uh, how's the spraying where you're at in the, terms of above you? Of, yeah. yeah, I haven't seen any yet. But then again, I haven't been looking. I, I mean, I I noticed things like, you know, ospreys. When I saw the ospreys flying around, I'm like, oh, hey, that is really cool. You know, I just love birds. So <laughs> um, I haven't, uh, I have, it's hard to tell too, because there's a lot of cloud cover here and it rains a lot. So even if they're spraying that crowd here, which I'm, I imagine they are, um, it rains so much. It's, they tell me during the summer, it rains every day, like clockwork, but not all day, you know, like Hawaii, it just rains and then it's done. So um, I, I just, you know, I, I thank God that I'm here, but I thank God every day anyway. You know, it doesn't matter where I am because this is an opportunity for all of us. Every day is just another opportunity to, to learn, to grow, and more importantly, to be of service. This is the thing. This is what keeps us on the path of light. It truly is the most profound way to, to um, ensure that you don't slip off into the path of darkness. Uh, because it, it, typically that's what happens. People get into a point where they, they feel victimized or, and then so they want to, they figure, screw everybody else. You know, it's what about me, poor little me. And then they go, they go into this service to self nonsense. It's almost I, like a self-indulgent virtue signaling thing. Sorry, I meant, so, yeah. You know, it's so weird because it's, it's like, uh, they're, they're, they're so focused on what everyone else is doing, but feel like they're helping the world by pointing it all out. But in the end, right. they're just really hurting themselves more than ever. Yeah. It's like hamster stuck on a wheel, but okay. I meant, I was, did I say, okay. I meant service to others will keep you on the path of light. Yeah. Service to self takes you down the path of darkness. Being selfish is the opposite of reciprocity. It's, it's just like uh, when you don't care about others, Typically, others won't care about you in the same level. But if you do care about others, if you, if you provide a service to others whenever the opportunity arises, the odds are you're going you're gonna to do well in life. I mean, it's just it, because we're, we're not, um, we're, I mean, we're all together. We're, we're not like castaways on an island. You know, we're all have to, have to be together. And more importantly, because we're family. Family supports each other. That's what makes us strong is when we actually do help each other. And of course, that's why they want to degrade the family. I, ironically, um, you know, when we just think about our personal needs, we cut ourselves off from what we think we want in the first place. Right. We're defying the, the universal mechanics, which Mike already said is a two-way hydraulic pump. So now we're just pumping in one direction and it's only going to work for so long. So, uh, and then of course you won't ever, uh, enjoy just the, um, the well, exhilaration of giving in the first place, which, you know, actually becomes kind of a fun thing in and of itself. Yeah. So, uh, back to the, I don't want to just dwell on the, on the boys downstairs, but, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Steiner at all, but he talks about the eighth sphere and, uh, also he, uh, refers to Aramon. Yeah. And uh, and of course, it, it seems apparent that there are some uh, very dark folks amongst us that are intent on bringing Araman into an incarnated form. Uh, you know, some people think he's already there. So um, hmm. what do you think about all that? Uh, OK, so this is this is where I was trying to get to before about the folly of the foolishness of say thinking we've got to win you know, we've got to defeat the dark side. Um, sorry to tell you, but it, we're in the lower realms here. The only way, the only, the only thing you can win is your sovereignty. And that's sort of like buoyancy, you know, it's what the more light, the more resonance that you have individually, the more firmly you are on the path of light, you just keep ascending higher and higher. It's not just a fifth dimension. It's, I don't know how many there are, but the point is we, we need to, we want those of us who want to go home, we need to go home. And there's only one way and that's up. Okay. So there's always going to be some, an adversary, a Satan, a Lucifer, an Aramon, uh, whatever. But the head guy, Cal, 
he's not even, he's not personally doing all this. He's overseeing it. He's got plenty of souls that have voluntarily said, I'll be part of your administration because they chose to go to be, they think it's, they're serving themselves by doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's like, okay, sure. Sign your name. And you know, here's your assignment. And, and the thing is, they, they're constantly trying to trick us into coming over to their side. And some people fall for it for whatever reason. And it's not a permanent thing unless you want it to be. If you want to be stuck on the dark side, that's your choice. But God does not enforce that. He gives you the opportunity to make the, that. I think, I think of it as a mistake, okay? But um, it's available to anyone. And it's not just this world. See, this is the other thing. We're very myopic, thinking that earth is everything and mankind is like, there, there's an infinite number of worlds and life forms, and they're all going through the same process. I, I learned this when I got back from Hong Kong. I, I stumbled across a book. Actually, I was having a conversation with Jay Campbell. He was down in um, Peru with his wife, Monica. And he says, oh, I read this book about the children of light. I'm like, okay. So I look it up, and what do I find? I find a children's book about a, a, a friendly extraterrestrial who makes friends in California on a beach with, the, with this kid. And he says, do you want to see what a civilized world looks like? And he goes, I live on a civilized world. What are you talking about? He goes, no, you don't. Let me show you. <laughs> he, takes him, he takes him on this journey and he shows him what really a civilized world is like. I was blown away by this, okay? And I shared it with everybody, including Jay. And we had a laugh, but it was also very informative and enlightening in the sense that, you know, if you don't understand that you got a problem, you're never going to do anything to try and fix it, right? So this was, this was very instructional. And I started to, to tell people, look, this is, if I had to summarize it, it's like this. When a planet's level of science and technology is equal to or greater than its love and spirituality, it can become civilized. If the science and technology is up here, it isn't civilized and it's going to collapse on itself because it's unsustainable. And that's universal. Okay. I, why am I reading this in a children's book? Because the author said, he was told by the beings that he was having com communications with in, in South America. And he said, they said, you have to write this as fiction because nobody's going to believe you. They think they all live on a civilized world. They're going to be very insulted, you know, and, and, and they're going to disbelieve you. And the message will be lost. So just write it for kids. Well, I guess I'm a kid because I was blown away. I was like, oh, wow, that actually makes a lot of sense. And I'm so grateful the, these so-called synchronicities, you think, oh, that was an accident. No, this is what the cosmic web of light does when you're connected to, when we are connected to it. It connects us just like this computer, you know, it's a smart computer for a little what it does. But when I connect it to millions of other computers around the planet, wow, now it's like, now it's really amazing. It's actually can do a lot more. And the same is true for us. And here's the thing. If we, if we individually and collectively choose to make this a civilized planet, you know what's going to happen? We will become part of all the other civilized worlds. Because right now, they don't want, to, they don't want anything to do with us because we're not. Why would, why would you? You know, it's like, I don't really want to be friends with a crack dealer down the street. Not that I know there is. I'm just, somewhere around here, there's probably drug dealers, right? I don't want to, I don't want to hang out with them. But if they were like, you know, spiritually minded, they're meditating, you know, wheatgrass juice or whatever, <laughs> I probably, or let's go surfing. Yeah, actually, that's that's I'm looking to meet some surfing people around here, and hang out at the beach. That is the difference to me anyway, between being civilized and uncivilized. <laughs> kind of uh, did you ever, um, were you familiar with any of the books by Lob Sang Rampa? He was a uh, Tibetan. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and they're kind of fictional, but um, well, whatever. It's, uh, he had it's still good. Well, I just brought it up because he had a story where they had one adventure where one of the Tibetans, one of the masters, was communicating with beings from the inner earth, and the inner wow. earth 
uh, being sure saying, uh, you know, we don't want to have any yeah. contact with you anyway, just no, it's my true. memory of that. It's and, true. Uh, I do you know, think that's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you also look at um, life as maybe interdimensional, yes. you know, and not necessarily physical as we think yes. that there's many dimensions all, you know, parallel with each other. And it, it seems apparent with some other work I've dabbled in that there are beings of a, let's just say more of a, a greater awareness that don't want to have anything to do with this. Some of us, uh, some of them are yeah. actually, um, you know, dropping breadcrumbs to help us out. And then there's the boys downstairs that are literally manipulating us, uh, you know, over to the dark side. Right. So uh, quite an adventure, uh, that's for sure. And um, so what do you think? And in, in, uh, if you look into your crystal ball <laughs> over the next couple of years is, um, are we in the last throes of it right now where we're going to have all things revealed or uh, yes. is it going to take a while longer? Well, yeah, it's, it's a natural progression. I don't know if you remember that mm -hmm. surf shop, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it is a natural yeah. progression. Yeah. It, incrementally, we are becoming more and more awake because the energy, the consciousness is being amplified. And I was shown that back in 2013, but I'd already read about it previously and sort of forgot about the fact that our planet, what do I got to show for this? It's like the solar system is, okay, if this is the, sorry, if this is the galaxy and it's, it's spinning around like a, a record a disc, our solar system actually goes like this. Okay. Now, this is very light. There's a lot of energy throughout the, the, the galactic plane is what they call it, the equator of the galactic plane. So when we're down here, it's darker. And when we get up into here, it's, we're all in alignment with the galactic core and it becomes very bright. It's called the photon zone or a photon band. For some reason, NASA calls it the fluff. I don't quite understand it. But anyway, so we pass through this. It's going to take two or 300 years, according to NASA. And then we'll go back up into here and we'll be in a darker region for like 12,000 years. And then we come back down to the light, to the dark, to the light, to the dark. So this is a natural process. And why is it important? Because it's, again, if we go back to the analogy of a classroom, this is finals week. It's not the best analogy either. I'm sorry, I don't have much... Better analogies, we all have to graduate or fail. Those of us who are here on earth right now um, have an opportunity as we enter this realm of light or a, a much higher degree of consciousness. If we choose to go down the path of darkness, uh, this is the wrong place for us. We just literally like get evicted from this realm that we're entering. We actually, and it started back in the 60s, but it really became... In, started to intensify in 85 and 87 to 2012. Anybody who's still here after 2012 is, is, is fully immersed in this photon band, this realm of light. And that's why the, the beings of darkness are freaking out. They're desperate and they're, and they're all being revealed naturally. They're so desperate, they've, they can't help it. They can't hide who they really are anymore. Sort of like when you flip the switch on and the cockroaches all try to scur scurry, <clears throat> they uh, they're they're free. they just they know they're losing a, their grip. So as you mentioned before, they're trying to recruit as many souls as possible right now while they still have time, very little time left, and to to draw them over to the dark side. Yeah. Go ahead, NASA, go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say there, we know about that. Are you familiar with the letter from Mar, uh, uh, Albert Pike to Marzini? Yes. In the late 1800s, where it laid out World War One, World War Two. Yeah. Uh, way before. And then they talk about World War Three being um, the uh, Muslims versus Israel. And that's never really played out. Right. So, yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. It's like they, 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 they tried their shot. And it seems like whether it's some benevolent 
ascended masters helping or it's just enough of our consciousness has come around where it seems like they played their cards they've now kind of doing this whole scamdemic thing trying to get us into a fake virtual world so that we lose touch with our our humanity or with our soul but I agree with you. I, I feel like there is just so much of this awakening happening right now of people figuring this stuff out. I feel like they are really desperate right now, and it's causing them to make a lot of mistakes. Yes, yes. Uh, and the thing is, it's causing us to do a lot of good, but that's just the beginning. This is just the beginning of the end for the dark side. We have to do something afterwards. Okay. Part of it is working together, like you see the, the truckers are doing, real, taking our power, declaring our sovereignty, not allowing the tyrants to impose their will. The thing about a mandate, I, I just recently found this very fascinating. The legal definition of a mandate, does it, does it, it's not mandatory unless we agree to it. We assume it's mandatory, therefore we agree to it. It's a very tricky loop. Again, this is how the dark side manipulates us. So we have to agree to it. And it, it's, it's a metaphor for the bigger picture. None of this stuff is mandatory unless we, not, I'm not, not just on this world, but all the different realms. We don't have to agree to any of that stuff. And once we figure that out and start to move forward with that knowledge, coming from a place of, of authority and power and divinity, uh, then we not only empower ourselves, we empower others that we encounter along the way because like i said this is the thing about being of service to others it's not just i mean it's not one thing it's everything you never know when you can be of assistance to someone else or when they can be of assistance to you and really make a difference um the thing about the thing about the the love quote oh that was the other thing was i learned about civilized worlds they, and of course, this was fictional, but they were saying that they measure a, a soul's love quotient, like we do the intelligence quotient, the IQ. They have a way. <laughs> well, I mean, you look at all these so-called masters, you can tell that they're, they're exuding a, a tremendous amount of love. And, and so we have that ability. It's just most of us haven't cultivated it. And I would recommend... It's just a thought, but I would recommend that people spend less time on these devices, even though we're using it to communicate something positive. It's very negative to spend too much time on these. Kind of looks like that thing out of uh, 2001, right? Mm -hmm. Monolith. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. It, yeah. it's, it, it's, you know, and it's not just like the Anunnaki, the fallen ones. It's all, all of it. All of that stuff. The dark side is real. It's, it's throughout all the lower realms. And we're always going to be confronted by it, but we don't have... I'll give you an example. So I drive across the country. It's very interesting. Um, I'd never done that before. I get to Daytona Beach. And I was really glad to be at the beach again. And I walked out on the water and I was standing in the water and I'm like, yeah, okay, great. This is my new home. And... Uh, that evening, I had a nice meal. I come back to the hotel, and I, I saw there was a, a Hard Rock hotel down the street. So I thought, I've never been to one of those. I'll just go check it out because I could. I, when I drove by it, I could see they had musical instruments and stuff. I love to play guitar, so I just I went. As soon as I walk out of my hotel, it's like a half mile away. I walk out on the street, and I hear some guy on the other side of the street yelling. He's cursing. He say, "GD it, GD it." He said this, and like. Uh, I, don't know, I couldn't see him, but I'm hearing him and I'm feeling his vibe. And I'm like, so I start, I start yelling out, God bless it. And he'd say, GD. And I'm like, God bless it. I don't know. It was weird. It was just one of those weird moments, right? So I walk down to the hard rock and I, and I look around and buy a couple of things. I'm walking back. Now I'm walking back to the hotel. And all of a sudden there's just this shooting pain in my back. And I realize I got hit. And it, I look up and there's this truck driving by. It was two guys, I think, in a pickup truck. They're going like 40 oh. miles an hour down the street and they, they chucked an egg at me. And it hit me and it and exploded naturally, right? And I, I started cursing. I said, what the F, you know? 
And then I said, GD it. And then I went, whoa, wait a second. That's exactly what. No, I said, okay, wait, wait. And I started again. I started, God bless Daytona Beach. I'm walking down the street at night. Oh, it's God bless Daytona Beach. Because I wasn't going to let them do that to me. You know, I can, I clean the egg off or whatever. And the bruise eventually is going to clear up and stuff. But, you know, this is just how it is. I'm on the path of light. And what are they trying to do? They, they tried. And for a second there, I started to slip. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, no. No, <laughs> you're not going to get me to go there, guys. No. God <laughs> bless it. it, it it's in high school. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say in high school, I think I've said this before on the show. We uh, we used to yell stuff out of the car, but really like positive, loving things to take. <laughs> be like, kiss your mom. Good night. Or like, <laughs> make sure <laughs> we were like, God loves you more than, you know, when people, cause people were a bunch of punk kids and they were first thinking, you know, what are these kids yelling at us? But it, yeah. Yeah. It was just, yeah. That's cool. It's a good, good way to like, you know, switch it up. Wow. That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing we have to understand is uh, the, the ones that have gone down the whatever path you want to call it of darkness, they've lost their tether to that, to that yeah. heart connection and to yeah. universal love. And you can't create, you know, right now, right. all they can do is create empty thought bubbles, but they need our energy to manifest that. And as soon as we understand that we are the batteries, and that's why they're so freaked out, you know, they're, yes. they're losing us and they, they lose their batteries there. It's a done deal for them. So, right. um, you know, that's why they just try to engage us in any way possible, whether, they, whether it's freaking us out, you know, with fear or keeping us engaged sexually or you right. know, any of the lower chakra emotions. They've got to have us there because they need that energy. And uh, the, the moment we stop giving it to them, problem over. Well, yeah. And it also makes us feel healthier and happier and, oh, yeah. and actually a lot smarter. I, I, I think we function a lot better when we're not doing that for them. Uh, so the thing is, they, they, they don't really, they can't create, you said, but what they do is manipulate. They can manipulate and they, they get us to give them the energy and then create things that are serving their agenda, like atomic weapons or nuclear power or whatever. Uh, fake, that, fake legal stuff that makes us feel all, like, like you were saying with the mandates where it's yeah, like that's we're soft, literally giving that to them. It's called sophistry. The root is uh, Sophia. They love to, they, they're, they're also very misogynistic for some reason. I, you know, I don't understand how they got into that, that space. The divine feminine is beautiful. We call it mother nature for a reason because it's nurturing, just like a mother. And if you don't respect that, if you don't love that, you're in a very bad place. You know, so you'd also said their, their heart sh is shut. So they're not connected to the web of light. It's, it also means this is why they're psychopathic. They have no empathy. Psychopathy is the opposite of empathy. It's just the polar opposite. And it, it, it couldn't be any more stark. The polarities are so extreme. And they've actually become more extreme now because the, the amplification as this, as this energy, as this light, as this consciousness comes flooding into our entire solar system now. Um, if you're in a good place, it's actually getting better and brighter. If you're in a bad place, it's like, I feel like crap. So again, uh, you know, there's certain things that I have just been doing less of and feeling better. Um, now I know you guys have your devices. I came across, Jay Campbell sent me something from a company and I tried it. I kept it in the car as I was going across the, the country. There's towers everywhere now. And they're huge. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And they're 360 and they're broadcasting all this crap. Do you got one? Anyway, it's, it, it emits scalar waves. And some people don't know what that is. They, are, they may think it's like something dangerous. And it can be if you use it the wrong way. But essentially what it is, is it creates a bubble of this particular scalar wave that is a healthy frequency around you within a nine foot, this is a portable device, okay? It's a portable scalar wave generator. And it, so it, it doesn't fully shield you, it just overrides those those frequencies that are dissonant, that's that's it. It's, it's, yeah. it's not that and, complicated, go ahead. Yeah, those are the great technologies because you're not trying to 
prevent something or fight against something. You're just creating an overwhelming, uh, just like you're talking about with your feelings and how you respond to yes. people. The good yes. technologies, like I, I favor biogeometry and Oregon technologies, because now yeah. you're just harnessing universal energy, the, yeah. you know, the natural harmonics of nature. And it's like taking a dirty sidewalk and just opening up a fire hose. It's just going to overwhelm anything on there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, you're just creating healthy things to overwhelm the other things, because when you're doing that, you're drafting the entire uh, universal realm higher levels in the first place and and the other stuff is just going to disappear in its midst so, so, so you know, there's a there's a saying when we say we're always surfing the web the mm -hmm. same is true <laughs> for the web of light when you text because mm -hmm. the pictures that like i have on my website it doesn't really it's it shows you all the interconnectivity but what it doesn't show mm -hmm. you in 3d is the, the kinetic energy, the flow, it's, it's constantly flowing. So it's like a stream or a river or an ocean. Or, and, it, and there are waves of consciousness that are flowing all the time. So why do I bring that up? Because as, as, a, as surfers, as you guys, we all know, you, you can't force the wave. You have to flow with it. And, and that's the thing about when in Star Wars, they talk about the force. You have to flow with it you have to go with the flow otherwise it's not going to work with you it, it's like you, you can't control it and it doesn't really control you but you, you there's a symbol in other words there's a symbiotic symbiotic relationship there it enhances us and we enhance it it's 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 very interesting yeah you're being the conduit and if you don't mind me expanding go ahead. on these go ahead mike and i was just saying you're being the conduit more than anything you're letting it come yeah. through you're accepting yeah, uh, you're in that's all in unconditional love in the end. That's what all we're talking about here. The scalar energy, the orgon, like I've got little organite here and oh, cool. uh, shungite and yes. crystals and I mean, all that stuff. Right. Because it's like yeah. it's overpowering with unconditional love. That's yeah, that's really what we're talking about here. Go ahead, Bear. Oh, I was just going to make a stupid comment, you know, that has to do with the uh, surfing snobbery. I'm an old uh, longboarder <laughs> and uh, I believe in, you know, kind of just carving with the natural contours of the wave rather than doing ferratic surfing and ripping oh, it God. off. Hey, it's, yeah. it's both fun, but uh, I'm an old soul surfer. I'll just say Yeah, that. me too. Me too. Yeah. Uh, well, but, you know, back in the day, like I told you, it was earlier, my grandpa was one of the guys, first guys to surf Malibu Point when it was private. And you had to build your own board. And those boards were over 100 pounds. If you got hit with one, good luck. And I don't, I'm not even sure they had, I don't think they had skags or fins on them on the tail. I think you had to hit, I think you said you had to put your foot in the water. Well, maybe that was the Hawaiians. Yeah. Anyway, the bottom line is you couldn't, guy. you couldn't do crazy maneuvers, aerials and all that stuff on those boards and uh, very hard to maneuver. And um, mm -hmm. all right. And it kept, oh, so, and I think it was, I remember this, he told me that the, the great innovation came from a guy, I think his name was Simpson, Sims, Simmons? Sim, Sims, Sims, at Palace Verde's point, he had one gimpy arm and it was just too much for him. You know, he needed a lighter board. So he, he started using um, uh, fiberglass and foam. And it, it, he's the one that innovated it because he had a need. Otherwise, I don't know what would happen. Now, I know it's gone to some very extreme, like toe-in and all this stuff is pretty amazing what they're doing. But the essence of what you were saying, Doc, about being a soul surfer and connecting with that energy, that cosmic energy in a very fluid way, in a very divine, sacred relationship with nature or God, that's really, to me, the whole point of it all. And I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with the, uh, the athleticism of some of these characters, but it just, it went from being something very peaceful and loving to a very aggressive thing. And, you know, localism um, you was can't a even You can't even surf that PV point much anymore because of oh, the, no. uh, uh, the gangs there. Um, yes. I, yeah, we had, I used to live in Redondo Beach. So, oh, so you know about that. I, I know that. A lot of Bay lunatics, yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are, so if people don't know what we're talking about, um, some guys, mostly guys, I think it's all guys, when they, they live at a particular beach, even if it's open to the public, they tend to um, treat everybody like uh, trash. 
and they think that they have some sort of um, right to be rude or sometimes just outright violent to try and uh, intimidate people, much like what happened to me at Daytona Beach. Like I'm flashing back on localism. It's like, really? That's what the locals do is throw eggs at people? Uh, you know, well, I guess that would, that would cut back on tourism. But the bottom line is this. Um, they're just hurting themselves when they do stupid stuff like that. And um, they don't own the beach. Nobody owns the waves. And uh, we should all enjoy it together uh, as brothers and sisters, you know, as family. That, honestly, I had more fun surfing with, with strangers, that, you know, if we're having a good day and everybody's like the first time I ever got tubed at Zuma beach, it was an offshore day. I'll never forget it. And I, I was, I did, I, you know, when like the, the curtain just blows off the top of the wave, you can barely see. Well, I got in there and it was so incredible to actually be looking. I was fully inside and I was looking at this thing. I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting out of here. And then suddenly, the green the, room. yeah, but I mean, this time that was, and this is the only time I've ever actually been spit out of the tube the pressure built up behind me and spit me out so fast. Instead of being collapsed on me, it spit me out. And I came shooting out of there going, wow, yeah, like this. And the, some of the guys on the beach are going, yeah, like this, because they saw the whole thing. And I'm just like, we were so electrified by that. And you know what that, what, that's a great kind of uh, representation of what's so beautiful about the human experience is that you got to share that with others. Yeah, we are. We require each other to have the fulfillment of experience. I believe if you're by yourself. That would have been great. It would have been a spiritual moment. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. But but having the others to share that with the community, and that's what like surfing and other sports that I do, snowboarding and stuff. It's yeah. all about meeting the stranger on the lift as I'm going up, and then we we hit an epic run together, and you have yeah. that experience together, and that's really what it's all about here. And we got to remember that, like we are yeah. social creatures, and to yeah. have that that experience together, and the surfers that are like the gang that are kicking people out talk about just total like the opposite of what surfing is all about like the spiritual yeah. essence of it they just don't yeah, get it this is what we've been talking about the whole time here is really the difference between the dark yeah. and the light you know it can be either or and it started off beautiful the the sport of kings <laughs> and now it's the it's just well it's it's devolved but i can see it coming back I can see it coming back from, from people like us. You know, we're going to we're going to take it back to that level because people are going to look at this and go, what are they talking about? What does that mean? You know, soul surfing. You're uh, seeing it with a lot of stuff like I'm active in a, yeah. a music scene and you're seeing it with a lot of people getting back into music for the right reasons, because the uh, industry has become so rotten. Um, same, yeah, um, I think people are finding their sole purpose again and what they want to do in their art. That's yeah, what my son friend. does, actually. He's 26 now, and um, his artist name is Sad Boy because his generation relates to that, all the angst and stuff. And um, yeah, but he's not sad. It's but ironic. He's, he's but the ironic. Lyrics, yeah, no, he, he's very ironic. He obviously takes after me. Uh, it's a bit sarcastic. <laughs> but he, he's also very observant in that he, he, um, in the conversations that he was listening to or having with people going to college and they were talking about all the issues that they're having about relationships. So he's like jotting this down to, you know, okay. So, and then makes fantastic lyrics because people can relate to that. I mean, the music's beautiful too. Okay. That's the other thing, even though he's in, uh, he's doing electronic dance music, which is something that I, I didn't pay any attention to until so he started producing, but because he was originally, I got him in a classical piano then it was uh, rock guitar, and then he went to jazz piano. He's got a pretty rounded musical understanding. Well, now you're a musician yourself, right? Yeah, my mom's a classical pianist, so I, I was raised to play music. It was sort of like mandatory. Actually, it was mandatory. I had to play in the play in the, yes, I had to play in an orchestra. Play the violin which was totally wow. uncool when back <laughs> in the 60s. Uh, yeah, you know, that was really uncool. So uh, as soon as I was able, I grabbed a guitar and transitioned over to a guitar. Um, but, and so, yeah, I had an influence on my son, but he's taken it to a whole nother level. Because these days, you know, you can have a whole studio right in your computer 
And stuff that used to cost millions of dollars is now you can do it for like 10 grand or something. It just, so I'm, I'm really impressed by him. And, but because you brought it up, Mike, the music scene, I've known this for a long time growing up in Malibu about music and movies and stuff. That whole scene is so dark and uh, it's, it's very abusive to the artists. So this is the thing people are trying to figure out, including my son, how do you, how do you make a living? I mean, he's got, he had over 3 million streams in just like six months once he started putting on music because it was so good. It is good. But monetizing it, that's, that's a whole nother ball game because it is music business. And uh, he's not, he's not. Well, that gets, um, what? that gets into a lot of the work that Mike's involved with, you know, it's moving yeah. into uh, a financial system that rewards people oh, that that are searching great. for vocation instead of occupation. Right. And I think that's another silver lining here. That'd and, be uh, you know, Mike's, Mike's in deep with some really good folks that are, uh, you know, making that happen. So um, I, I, this financial system, as we know, is part of the, you know, the collapse right now. And it's going to yeah. create some upheaval, but, you know, good riddance because uh, yes. I, a lot of us don't want to be slaves to it anymore. So we'll Let's have, uh, what's the terminology you guys use, Mike? Uh, Value-oriented uh, uh, value commodities. For, and well, value for value model is something that mm -hmm. we're really into mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, differentiating between, uh, you know, before you used to pay for things based upon what people would require from the market, which, and we're all about the free market, but the idea is it's the going back to the gifting model. It's going back to the idea of like, I'm going to give to you what I feel like the value I get from you. And right. then you receive. And, and that's the other problem we have in society is we've forgotten how to receive too, because, uh, yeah. you know, but, but the idea also that we're, we're really focusing on is this idea of the creator class and, and, and us not, <laughs> you know, being uh, so much the, uh, uh, the worker bees, right. right. Raised from that Prussian, the, the Prussian uh, school system where we're just raised to be you know, working in a factory, whether that factory be a nine to five job for some like life insurance company or something. Um, yeah. But, but the idea being that we're not, on this in this realm to be doing that we're in this realm yeah. to be creating right yes. it goes back to the light and back to the love and so uh one of the benefits of this collapse coming <laughs> will be that we'll have new systems where we'll be able to have that value for value based on hey i like that song that your son make i'm going to give you um whatever this crypto or whatever this new type of um uh of currency is yeah. uh uh like that i send it over to you without any middleman or anyone involved it's just me right. p to p with your son and right. when we have our own contract together an agreement that i love your music i'm going to send you 50 uh uh value bucks or whatever it's sort of and it's 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 yeah. sort of starting with ntf i think they're calling well, the NFTs are the non-fungible okay. tokens. That's a whole yeah. other. That's a whole other ball of wax there. But that it is, is a really, really trippy when you get into that yeah, uh, non-fungible tokens. Because basically, yeah. what that's doing is that's saying that um, that song has unique value in the in the you know in this world that it and only of itself, it's its own unique thing. And now I will tokenize that and give it value based on my own perspective on how unique that is, like a work of right. art. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and so you can do that with your books. You can do that with a picture and a word uh, with anything. Um, and there's a lot of problems with it, a lot of corruption, of course, in the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so I work with a project called Cordal. If people listening are very familiar with it. We are reinventing how the internet works from the ground up. So the, we're decentralizing everything from the ground up with the, literally the hardware, starting from the hardware on up so that we have complete and total sovereignty over everything in the digital space. Wow. Uh, so that's what I work on uh, when I'm not working with Alpha Vedic and stuff. Yeah. And it's really exciting uh -huh. because one aspect of that is this idea of proof of experience where we can we can uh, engage with each other through experiences and those alone will have value. Like today, this experience people are having in this chat has value. Right. There's, you know, and if we can quantify that and, and, and provide some sort of metric for that, that is, that's the new money. That's wow. going to be the new money. Brilliant. Wow. Uh, can you send me something like a link or something more on yeah. that? Yeah, definitely. Wow, that is really good. See, see, and this is the thing I knew once the old system started collapsing because we simply don't want to participate anymore. 
that new opportunities were going to be created by us just because we've had it. We've had it, you know, we don't need to be, like you said, enslaved by their corruption anymore. Um, and it does inhibit, like, you know, not only does it inhibit the creative process, it, it, it filters it. For example, like rap, I don't listen to that stuff, but what I'm told is originally a lot of the music was actually very positive for that community. And then the, the lead rap artists were brought in to a meeting and they were given a lot of money and a lot of threats and a lot of drugs and said, you know, we want you to go, we want you to take us a different route. And it distorted everything. I mean, it just, just exactly. It's because music is actually, to me, it's like, um, it's a spiritual language. It's not just vocalization. It's something that really touches our soul more than just when we speak. Okay. It speaks to our soul. And it, that's, and it, it, and so in that regard, I think it's, I feel it is sacred. It's one of the reasons I don't bother with being a professional musician because I can just put it out there anytime I want to. And if people like it, great. If they don't, oh, well, you know, it's, it doesn't bother me either way. I, I don't want to get caught up in that. I, I also know that <clears throat> there is no way I would ever sign a deal or do anything like that. I, even my son is smart enough to know he, he, he did get a, a degree in business. So he knows that all the contracts are designed to screw over the artists. So why would you do that? Well, you know, we're moving towards decentralization and and that includes spirituality, right? Yeah. Away from religions, uh, the understanding that like what we're talking about today, mm. we're, we don't have to focus whether that's Jesus or whether that's Yahweh or, uh, <laughs> right? It's just, and, and that is playing on all levels, all yeah. levels of, of reality. So with music, with being an author, with uh, doing podcasts, Everything is person now, person to person and community based. And that is where the future is going. And it's just another sign of the old systems collapsing. They're, yeah. they're losing their grip. The dark ones are losing their grip because they require centralization. Right. 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 And, and it's all based on corruption and manipulation. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, people are tired of it. Mainly be, it's not just that. It's because our consciousness has, has been elevated dramatically and it's going to continue to for those of us that choose to continue down the path of light uh, i'll summarize it this way <laughs> um, it's all going to work out a lot better than we can imagine because our imagination is where everything comes from remember what i was saying about concept where they we call it imagination and treat it as like it's something trivial it's not it's fundamental it's primary it's you, you can't conceive of anything if you don't have an imagination. I mean, if you want to be creative, if you want to be corrupt, I guess it doesn't take a whole, a whole lot of imagination. You know, it's just, it's very, it's a process. It's just, it's, there's nothing creative about s screwing people over. That's really it's the only. Also, why <laughs> educate. Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead, Mike. No, you well, guys just because it's. It's also why education has become objective exams and oh, regurgitate information and you yeah. get a dog biscuit for the right answer. You know, uh, you haven't been up here, Robert, but what we're doing at, at Alpha Vedic is we have a working farm. Yeah. Uh, our whole project is farms to pharmacy because we grow medicinal herbs and, you know, then create things in the lab with, you know, what we grow. But our prototype is all about um, education and it's a five to 10 acre model where we have, uh, you know, all these farms that reproduce everywhere and everyone has wow. just a little bit of a different niche. Our thing is herbs. And, um, you know, it also not only decentralizes us and gets us away from very um, obtrusive factory farming, yeah. but it also gives more people the opportunity to re-engage in the natural order, get their hands in the, in the mm. soil themselves. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, so that's what we're up to here. And we're going to be having a lot of, um, we're already started, but, you know, workshops and all everything, uh, you know, permaculture farming that we do, biodynamics, soil science, um, uh, laboratory education, teaching doctors, what a doctor should have learned in medical school, but none of us got to learn the real stuff. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing it and, you know, it's a blast. We're, 
uh, surrounded by people and engaged in activities every day where we're actually having a good time and surrounding ourselves with kindred spirits. And, you know, we kind of keep our ear to the ground so we know what the rascals are up to out there. But, um, you know, it's just not about giving them any energy anymore. So um, this has been a fantastic talk today. So how do you, any final um, things you want to talk about or things that, that, you know, we we didn't get to talk about that you like? um, uh, Just uh, we can... You know what? I, however when, you want. With the okay, keyword that pops up when you were saying that just now about your what you're doing because I did check out your website, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. I, I really commend you guys for what you're doing. That's awesome. I do think it's a it's a very important blueprint that you're putting out there mm-hmm. uh, for sustainability. And I know that's a buzzword right now, but I mean on a spiritual level, sustaining us. Uh, and here's the thing: there is a synergy. When souls of, of the light come together in a peaceful, loving, creative manner, the synergy is sustainable and it's beautiful. And everybody feels it. Remember the good vibrations <laughs> from the Beach Boys? Yeah, that's one a really one of my favorite song. songs of all yeah, time. Absolutely. You know, and that's, that's who we really are. This other stuff is an aberration. It's a temporary detour that we take. So then when we come back, we're like, oh, God, (laughs) I'm back. Like, I'm back at the beach. I feel I was born and raised at the beach. I'm back at the beach. I'm like, I'm relieved. I feel very happy about that. So, so, and my happiness, I, I feel happiness is contagious in a good way. Going viral doesn't have to be something, you know, crazy bad right we know it could be a good thing too so so please keep up what you're doing um i hope that like i've got a i've got an opportunity to develop a piece of property here but the the homeowners association doesn't want us to put any kind of certain plants like you know because i think it attracts animals so that's that's an issue otherwise i would probably just buy this place and and you know do it like a small garden, but eventually I'll get there, uh, a ranch type style, something or other. That's, that's been my wife and I, that's, that's our goal. Eventually when she stops working. Oh, you had mentioned something about factory work. Oddly enough, when I moved to Hong Kong in 2015, uh, it's just so damn expensive. Even my wife works in the toy industry and it's, it's a good, good gig. I mean, Pays well. It's a lot. It's a hard job. It's very competitive. Um, and that's how we ended up in New England and then Hong Kong came back here. Now that's how we're here in Florida is for her work. But um, when I was in Hong Kong, I got a job working in social compliance, which means like when a company in America hires a factory in Asia, they have to adhere to certain uh, rules not just local rules, but general rules. Like, and, and here's why that's an issue is because now with the internet, anybody can see what's going on in, in anywhere on the planet. So if, if consu- let's say you're, a, 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 you, if you're familiar with the brand and you love your brand and suddenly you read, well, they're using slave labor. Well, yeah, like kind of like Apple, even though I use Apple products, what they do there at uh, Foxconn in China. That's horrible. That is absolutely horrendously evil. So so social compliance is the the auditors go in there and they look at everything and everyone and they make sure everything is legal. And then they tell their clients. The problem is when the auditors don't, English is not their first language. So they write the reports in whatever, Chinglish or something. They send it to me. And I convert it over to American English. So by the time it gets to the corporate side, they're like, oh, okay. And there's no question about what the meaning is. Um, Why am I telling you that? Because everything that we have, you look around you, pretty much everything around you, it it was made in a factory pretty much in Asia these, these days, right? The conditions there are better, but it's still, I mean, you, we wouldn't want to work there. We would not know six days a week, like 10 hours a day. 
12 hours a day, whatever. It's just not pleasant. Uh, and um, it made me understand and appreciate more about the human condition uh, and, and how factories operate. It's not easy. Okay. And a lot of them are completely crooked. It's just, especially in Asia, that's just how it is. You know, uh, they pay they, the payoff, they bribes, bribes. So, um, and of course, the main thing social compliance does is make sure the workers are not being abused and the environment is not being abused. So I feel like this is a good gig. I've been doing it for over six years now, but I've learned a lot. And I can tell you right now, we could do a lot better. And we will. I think 3D printing is, is just the beginning of what we can, what we can do to, to manifest a much more equitable, ethical world for all of us. Okay, There shouldn't be all these, these people stuck in factories for the majority of their life getting exposed to uh, toxic crap. Yeah, you know, uh, it's a condition of globalism uh, it and in, and the infinite growth model of uh, that that consumerism drives through, uh, you know how the economic system is set up, and yes. I think it's all fracturing and falling apart. And as we get it decentralized, is. we'll like you said have three D printers in our house to to replace those factories and it'll be just, yeah. it'll be like the Jetsons in a weird way. It's like, okay. I embrace that tech. Oh, like, oh, no, no. Okay. Since you brought this up, you ever read the book, Tom, Tom Swift. It was a series of books called Tom Swift. It's, back I, in, it's an old, it's, it's doc. Do you remember this? You do. Okay. Oh, I, I absolutely remember, but that was back in my non-reading phase of life where I resisted <laughs> all forms of learning. Okay. In, in any case, the reason I bring it up, and anybody can access these books for free. It, they were put out specifically to get people off the farm and into the factories and or mm -hmm. to get engineering degrees because it, they wanted to make it seem cool to be an inventor and an entrepreneur. Now, one of the things that Tom Swift came up with was, uh, I forget what he called it, but it's to me, as soon as I read it, I was like, that's what the replicator is in Star Trek. He said, that if you get up in, out of the Earth's atmosphere, there's so much energy, because energy and matter, right? E equals MC squared. He said, you could just condense the energy into whatever molecular structure you wanted or needed in your craft with this device. Pretty amazing how they, somebody thought that up, right? Uh, so, so Walter, yeah, Walter well, Russell, of course, identifies right. every element on a periodic table as a waveform. So why right. not just uh, exactly. create with 3D uh, printers straight from the waveforms? You don't That's have to mind that thing. That would be the, the next iteration beyond so-called 3D printing. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. It's going to work out a lot better than we can imagine. But we need to start imagining this stuff. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So it's kind of a heart, cart, horse before the cart, cart yeah. before the horse kind of thing. We need to start imagining these things. That's why we're having these discussions. It's not just to, you know, entertain people. Although hopefully people thought this was at least. Well, and also to inspire people to yeah. go out and do the imagining themselves because yeah. it's every single one of us is an individual node in the greater collective network. Yeah. And we all have the same power to create like a whole, like all be our own Teslas and create, you know, <laughs> technology that today seems like impossible, but tomorrow will be, you know, uh, uh, in everyone's household. I, and it's happening like, yeah. you know, <clears throat> so very exciting, man. Hey, uh, this has been a really wonderful talk, Robert. Thanks so much. We really covered a lot today, and we definitely want to have you back on uh, in the right. future too. Because I'd I like to get like you guys. Yeah, you guys got to come on my show sometime. That'd be oh, that would be great. Love to. Yeah, love to. Robert, yeah. really awesome getting to know you here. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, looking forward to keeping the connection. So uh, let's keep talking. Sounds good, guys. Thank you so much. And I will make Thank sure you. to put I will make sure to put your uh, links in the show notes below. So okay. go check out uh, Robert's show and uh, the website. And uh, Robert, for those listening right now, what is the best website for people to find you at? Uh, there's only one, unicusmagazine.com. It's spelled U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. It's all there. And you can, you can people can email me there if they wanted to. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Well, hey, enjoy those sunny uh, tropical days there out in Florida. And uh, you are in a very abundant place. I mean, you can go just grab a papaya right off the tree. I'm, I'm, I must say I'm <laughs> pretty envious right now. So uh, yeah, and get in that water and uh, we'll see you next time. And everybody, I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you did, please give us a thumbs up, share with your friends and family, subscribe if you haven't already. And we will see you next week with the great uh, Kelly Brogan, MD. And uh, don't forget to check out uh, Dr. Bear Lando at Anarchapoco next uh, week. They do that live streaming as well uh, through the virtual uh, sign up you can do there. That's at anarchapoco.com. Love you guys. See you next week. Cheers. <laughs>